Now, guys, before we get started on this week's podcast, I want to talk to you about our Momentum Mastermind. The Mastermind is our 12-month program for men who want to surround themselves with other committed men, all with similar interests, values, and goals. Whether you're looking to build or grow a profitable lifestyle business, develop financial freedom, get in the best shape of your life, or create an intimate and epic relationship, the Mastermind is perfect for those who are looking to have it all. We know that to create these results and this kind of lifestyle on your own can be super challenging. So join now for your free 30-day trial. Simply visit our website, www.themomentumlifestyle.com.au. Up the top, you'll see a section for programs. Click on the programs, you'll see our mastermind and you can sign up there now for your free 30-day trial valued at $1,000. We look forward to seeing you part of the mastermind. Mr. Tim Morrison, welcome to the podcast. What is going on, brother? Mate, good to have you here. Looking forward to talking breath and uh, everything trauma-related and maybe even some dad stuff as well. But before we whip into that, can you give the guys a 60 to 90 second spiel of who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, man. So I am a breathwork facilitator. I uh, founded the Spiritus Breathwork and Somatic Healing um, Training System. Uh, so we teach people how to how to do that. I'm a men's work facilitator, multi, multi-instrumentalist, ceremonialist. But above all that, man, like I just, I don't ever really like to be boxed into as, as one one thing, man. So I'm just a, just a man doing his thing, um, <laughs> searching for freedom and liberation within and, and just spreading that message with the world. I like that. We will come back to that for sure. So you speak of breath and obviously it's a... Um, massive thing these days and i reckon we'll mm-hmm. get bigger um and i was very fortunate to um learn breath underneath you which um, i'm super grateful for what's your style of breath work and how might it be different to a breath that other people might be aware of uh, So we use we use the breath in two main forms through spirit is one is uh more of like an embodied breath to help people release tension through the nervous system, discharging through the nervous system, um, releasing trauma, and also using it to access his altered states of healing to provide deeper spaces of remembrance of um, almost like these like uh, soul retrieval type things, man, um, and really give these people this, this really powerful embodied experience of, of what the breath is about. Uh, we I teach people more through the lens of being trauma-formed in there and using breath as a way to create sustainable change and impact for people rather than just having to blow people out of the water and this being this huge kind of cathartic experience, which, you know, can be really healing and and helpful for people. Um, However, if people are like, you know, highly dysregulated in the nervous systems, it's going to cause like more of that, that, um, that fracturing for them than, than helping them. So um, yeah, we'll also use it as a way to, teach people how to regulate their nervous systems as well um, and how to create more flexibility and resilience through the nervous systems by, by using the breath so that when life does present itself with its challenges and um, you know, the unexpected things that, that happen to us as humans, that we are able to, to be more grounded and present through it rather than going deep into these reactive or these survival responses and coping mechanisms to, um, to move through it. So what's the importance of a flexible and resilient nervous system and how would someone, one, identify if they've got a flexible and um, resilient nervous system and potentially what are the signs that someone might not have that? Yeah, we've looked at the two main branches of the nervous system, one being the sympathetic branch, um, which is like you get up and go. Most people know it as like your fight or flight response however it's like putting the gas on the pedal like right now we'll be in a sympathetic branch of that just by speaking and 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 talking um the other is the parasympathetic and that you know goes into to the um dorsal vagal which is complete immobilization and into the ventral vagal which is more about you know social engagement and generally that's where you want to be most of the time but however when we talk about being flexible it's it's having the ability to swing between the two so think of as as a sympathetic as foot on the gas and the parasympathetic the ability to put the foot on the brake and so what can happen is when people have a dysregulated nervous system they may be more dominant 
in the sympathetic response. So they are um, highly active. They might have a lot of anxiety. They might be prone to panic, um, always on the go, do, 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 um, can't ever quiet down and and stop. And then they don't have the ability to completely re- relax. So even when they're laying down, the mind's still processing, still thinking all the thoughts, right? So they're still having this sympathetic um response and then the other as well as some people can be completely immobile they might not have not enough energy to get out of bed they're really fatigued depression and things like that right so they might not have the ability to put the gas on the pedal to get them into that sympathetic response um, so having a flexible nervous system is having the ability to swing between the two and to um, pendulate between either of these throughout the day no matter what is happening in the world And so when life calls for the time to sit and relax, are you able to sit and relax and come to that space of rejuvenation? When the time calls to get up and go, that you can do that as well. So you you have the ability to swing. And a lot of people have just lost this ability, right? They're they're either stuck in one or the two, and that's just due to um, unresolved trauma, like a a short window of tolerance um, and a dysregulated nervous system. And so when people learn to use the breath and they can learn to get into different parts of somatics, they can learn to uh, create more uh, flexibility through that nervous system where they're teaching the nervous system where it's safe to be and safe to release, safe to, to, to express in these different ways. One of the best things I learned from you over that 12 weeks was the window of tolerance, which I kind of had heard a little bit about it and understood its role with the nervous system. How do you explain that to someone who might be starting out and the importance of kind of expanding that window of tolerance? Really simply, the your window of tolerance is the space that you're able to tolerate life and where you're able to tolerate experiences within life. So you think of it like this, right? Any any time that you snap and you and you blow out of control, you go into chaos and you're unable to be regulated, like you lose sight, then you're going outside of your window of tolerance. You're now experiencing things that are intolerable to you and and your nervous system. And so most of the things that create a smaller window of tolerance is unresolved emotional wounds, like trauma. Um, It could be like lack of sleep, not enough food, not enough um, good quality nutrition or or water, um, not enough connection, not enough intimacy. All these things can really shorten and, and create like a smaller window of tolerance. When we start to discharge nervous system energy, when we start to release and heal these uh, unresolved emotional wounds, we start to uh, create these completed cycles of arousal from trauma that's happened in the body. The window of tolerance naturally starts to expand and uh, you're able to, to experience more of life. And so when we talk about things that are, are tolerable, sometimes things can still feel uncomfortable, but you can tolerate it. Right. So most of the time when when we go into these states of um, uh, people start to feel sensations in the body that are uncomfortable and it'll also mean that that's not tolerable to them as well and they can blow outside the window of tolerance. However, when we get into breath work, when we get into somatic work, you are uh, coming back into contact with these sensations within the body and you learn to create safety um, while also feeling these sensations of tension or that feels uncomfortable like discomfort and you're essentially telling the body that it's, so it's safe to feel these things, right? So when you can soften into it, you can feel what is underneath it because most of the sensations are the sensations of the language of the body, right? So we are uh, uh, experiencing what the body has to say through connecting to these sensations. But often uh, these sensations can feel so uncomfortable with people, people numb them, push them away, that when they do feel them, they can plumb straight out of out of the water. Um, so say for like someone that really experiences a lot of anger, they can feel only angry when they are in that complete rage cycle where they've just blown right out. They're like in this complete survival response and they just only see black and white, only seeing red and they're just like going after it, right? However, when we start to work through the window of tolerance and you start to come into contact with these different sensations in the body, when people can catch the very first signals and sensations of what anger feels like in the body it could be an elevated heart rate it could be that there is tensing of of the hands that might feel like a heat rush through the body but whatever these first signals and sensations are when you can start to catch that and then start to feel what it's like when it gets to like 20 to 30 percent even more you can start to go okay cool i'm starting to experience anger right now 
rather than identifying as I'm fucking angry or I'm raging, but I'm experiencing anger, you can, you can learn to, right? What is anger teaching us? It's, you know, generally a protective emotion. So is it, it's either protecting us from a deeper emotion that we don't want to feel or that we see as weak or a threat, or we are perceiving that there is a, a threat, right? And sometimes these threats aren't real threats. They're just you no know, threats against that ego and and uh, wherever we're at, right? And it's also teaching us where boundaries are being crossed or about to be crossed. So when we can connect to this emotion of anger through these smaller sensations, when we can have awareness around that, when we can start to regulate ourselves as we're feeling it, but also bring into our awareness of what am I experiencing anger towards or for, and if it is boundaries, cool, let's speak into the boundaries before we get into this state where we are, are unable to um, uh, speak clearly with what we are experiencing rather than just going to this full rage out where you're breaking things, being really dysfunctional, maybe like, being violent or destructive right and you know anger is a big one for people because most people are completely disconnected from it or they only experience it in in the height of the emotion where it does lead to violence destruction and hurting and harming themselves or or someone else so when we get into the window of tolerance where we're um, able to also feel what's inside of that right so in that window of tolerance so we have two uh, two parts of the brain, right? One is uh, thinking, learning brain. This is when we're in ventral vagal and when we are able to um, have full like cognitive function or executive function, we're able to understand other people's ideas and uh, understand, have more compassion for people. When we go into that, outside that window of tolerance, we go straight into our trauma brain or our um, survival brain where we lose that cognitive functioning. We We lose that executive functioning and we only see like one way and that's how we survive um so when we start to learn about that survival brain and the thinking brain and how that relates to us in our window of tolerance um is an absolute game changer this was one thing that really changed a lot of a lot of stuff for me when i started to learn about the window of tolerance and how that affects us on our day-to-day -day range and um how we will like it will go up and down in this window of tolerance throughout the day you know, so sometimes it might go up, sometimes it might go down, it really depends on, on where we're at. Um, and so when we look at the flexibility of the nervous system, it's knowing that we can go up and down within that window of tolerance and then still come back to a place of neutrality or being in this like balanced homeostasis. I resonate with a lot of that, as you know, from doing your breath work on a personal level. How's your window of tolerance changed over the years? Because you were a fair mad dog back in the day. <laughs> How has your nervous system and your window of tolerance changed and what filters in which you see the world through change as well? Because you're very attuned these days to the subtleness because of the work that you do. But how's that mm. kind of process look like for you over the last decade or whatever it might be? Yeah, a huge, huge amount. And so when we look at like nervous system regulation, once your, your body starts to learn how to regulate it starts to become like an autonomic response right so you're not having to consciously think about oh i need to regulate right now but your body's just starting to be more just able to regulate more more consistently right so i've noticed that within myself that there's times that would normally blow me out that would i feel really calm and and relaxed in um and even like in the work that i do there's just sounds expressions releases that just don't rattle my nervous system um, and I'm able to stay present and grounded in that. So that's been a huge thing as well. Uh, working through with relationships as well. This is what life is about is, is healing these parts and, and moving forward, but there's always going to be something that pops up that kind of hits you left field. Right. But it's now you have the tools to be able to work through what arises rather than being like, Oh, I'm going to go complete into avoidance and shut down, or I need to fight against this, but let's breathe into this. And why am I experiencing what I'm experiencing? Let's get to a deeper level and speak into that into that space one of the things if if a bloke in particular is um new to the work or even new to your language is they might potentially see themselves as unwavering which is a, a healthy anchor for the masculine mm -hmm. but not realize the difference between neutral and numb how would you describe that in terms of one the importance of the masculine being quite unwavering and, and that anchor but also the difference between just being numbed out because anyone can be an anchor when they're just completely mm -hmm. numb but also what that looks like to be neutral 
yeah so when when you're in that unwavering space you're still able to feel right you're still connected and i think some people get this mixed up they'll think that they're like really grounded but they're ju- they've just actually disassociated from from the experience right so you're able to sit with what you're feeling and to breathe it through without attaching to it and making it mean something and this, this really comes down as well in relationship right when there might be a big argument that's happening with your partner but are, are you able to sit and be present with that and understand that perhaps it's not something that is happening from you but it could be something that your partner is experiencing and it's got nothing to do about you but you were just reminding them of something that has happened in the past and when we start to be able to view life through the lens that you know everyone is working through their own trauma some people are conscious of it other people are completely unconscious of it but when you realize that most people are acting from these places of unresolved wounds and trauma then it's easier to have a bit more more compassion but i would say like the biggest difference between that that bunkering down and kind of numbing and being that unwavering is that you know so deeply in yourself that you are you are holding that right now you are unattached but you're not disconnected from it whereas some people can disconnect from it they can feel like they're holding but they've actually just disassociated from the sensations that they're feeling in that moment so they might feel like they're being present but they're actually numb to the experience and they're not letting the experience um move move them right so they've like numbed out from it so there's like a subtle difference but you would you will know how you feel in that moment you use the word disassociation um a bit and as as you're aware i was very good at disassociating when i was trying to do breath work with you numerous times what what does disassociation mean to someone who's learning this language for the first time yes the disassociation is coming out of the body right so you are are no longer present with the experience or the sensations that are there for you and we remember that these are survival responses right so you're not choosing to disassociate right you're not like oh my god this is too much i'm i'm checking out there's definitely times where that could be true but for the most part these are all autonomic responses right the same as fight or flight like this can bring up a lot for people because something might happen and in their mind, the whole time, they might be like, I would always fight. I would always attack. I would always protect. But then something happens and they freeze and they shut down or they want to run away. And then they bring shame out. They're like, I, I can't believe I acted in that way. But these are all survival responses. They're all autonomic responses. You mentioned their fight and freeze, I think. Um, what are the four typical ways that someone might respond and what are a couple of examples of of each of those yeah so the two sympathetic responses is you fight and flight so fight is um, moving towards wanting to attack wanting to protect um, and generally like the the energy is in the upper body and this is the surge to kind of like um to fight against the the threat or whatever is there then there's flight and the energy tends to go more down towards the legs where there's is wanting to run away, wanting to escape, perhaps maybe wanting to avoid um, or, or get away. And then we have um, freeze, which is when they go into complete immobilization. So the fight or flight response, there is an immobilizing energy where there's like they get the surge of energy to either fight or run away. And then it goes into a complete immobilization where... Um, the nervous system is like it's safer for us to shut down and not be present here and so this can look like numbing this can look like complete withdrawal um like no not feeling any kind of sensations in the body feeling like where you're just staring off into space and sometimes like daydream as well can be in that that disassociative state uh and then there's there is fawning right which is where you this is more the survival response in the social engagement where you are um pleasing and appeasing people right it's you've learned to create safety by by making sure everyone else is is okay and um like you're fawning in that experience right you're um making sure everyone else is okay in that space um and so these these are all you know that like so it could be like you realize that you can't run away from someone so then you might try to fight and then you realize that the person's too big and strong so your body shuts down into that, right? Or it could be like, I can't fight or I can't run away, 
but I could make this person laugh or I could try to make them um, feel like I'm not a threat or I'm not a danger. So then I'm going to go into fawning. And so these are all like autonomic responses for us as well. You use the word auton- autonomic a lot. And I think it's super valuable for people to understand that. But what does an auto- autonomic response mean? It means it is happening unconsciously. Like you are not choosing it, right? It, it's it's coming from a different part of the brain where it is happening autonomically. Like you are not choosing to go into these. It's, it's happening as a response, as a reaction to the external stimulus and the internal stimulus that is is present in that very moment. Yeah, I find that really valuable because, and I, I assume this happens in your work, is people beating themselves up about the way that they responded without mm-hmm. the compassion and, I guess, curiosity of why and why that is and remembering that it doesn't come from, it's not a conscious choice. Yeah, it's not a conscious choice at all. Yeah. How has the way in which you view the world changed over the last kind of, say, five to 10 years in terms of how you connect with people, associate, um, communicate as an observer, one thing that stands out to me with you, and you've used this word a couple of times, is your level of um, compassion seems to con- continuously rise in terms of your ability to stay heart centered. And I assume it's a direct correlation with the amount of breath work you've done and the n- amount of nervous system regulation you've done, and es- essentially. Um, expanding your window of tolerance, but how's that process look like for you as you've kind of come more into your body and worked through your own stuff? Yeah, massive. You know, there's a lot of judgment that I held towards people um, for for a lot of years. And then when I started getting to like shutter work and things like that, I started to really see that most of the things that I was judging in other people is stuff that I was judging within myself. It's having this view that we are all one of the same we all have our own unique abilities we're all at different levels and stages in life but we're all reflections of each other right and when we are able to to view these as as you know an insight into where we are that's really helped me help me move um i've also become much more i guess conservative with who i spend my time with as well and who i want to surround myself with as well I used to, when I was young, I used to want want to be out and and about everywhere. And I really, really feel like even over this past year, I've actually become more introverted than I was extroverted before. Just wanted like a lot more alone time. Um, wanted just to be with some like close friends rather than having be surrounded by by everyone. So that's definitely been a big shift for me as well. And yeah, like really seeing like you know even over these the past few years with the whole COVID thing, whatever your stance is on that, is really seeing where the collective is at on both sides of the spectrum of people that are, you know, might be seen as unwoke, right. And people that see themselves as being these woke individuals or these spiritual people and, and how much judgment has gone on both sides when really it's just, there's so much happening, happening for people. Um, And I've also like been more boundaries have come into place for me as well around what I'm willing to engage in, what I don't want in my space people that I'm I'm open to work with uh, and people that I'm not open to to work with and, and even engage in. And I think that's been a really big shift, a really big shift for myself. So h- how does that work for you now? Because your profile and everything has grown a lot over the last few years and, and so has your work. How, how does that work as someone's work is growing, but they're feeling kind of more intro? What What have you had to implement to manage time energy boundaries and also now newborn adds another element into that as well so what's the kind of thought process you for you over the last from what i've seen anyway last three years in particular when things are really blown up and mm-hmm. you become more intro at the same time yes yeah, so having um like assistance at work for me as well so they manage the emails and and things like that like on social media i get so many messages and most of them go unanswered especially if they're just like random messages or if they're just asking for help and things like that. Like I literally can't um, spend time doing that. I used to message back everyone that would would contact me. Um, but now if you want to work with me, it goes through like an, an application process. And so I manage it that way as well. And not everyone that applies gets, um, gets access as well. So for example, even in the breathwork training, there's, there's people that have applied that have, you know, come with like one word answers to it and so if someone can't be bothered to to write at least a sentence 
then they're not going to be the right kind of candidate to to be in that space as well. So yeah, and then just uh, just been really working through um, the time that I need to spend for myself, time that I need to spend with my family, and then the time that I need to spend with with clients and and courses and things like that, and just finding that balance. And I've always been someone that just keeps pushing my edges as well. So it's finding finding that balance as well. And sometimes I just switch my phone off as well, man. So um, people literally just can't contact me and I'm just, you know, off for a couple of days and, and things like that. So even over like, even the last year, I would say I have been on um, social media probably like 50% less than what I normally would. Um, and it's still like keeps growing as well. So it's really showing me that there's like these different ways to to grow and still be looking after yourself in those ways. One of the big things in business um is someone's ability to hold themselves or hold their energy. If someone's thinking about their business and the importance of breath work in that, what's the, what's the combination of those two in terms of your ability to hold more energy, hold yourself, mm-hmm. um, you know, with nervous system and window of tolerance that you mentioned before? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question, man. So this is huge, right? So one of the things that we do with breath work is that we expand our somatic container of that, which we're able to, to hold and and to move through our body. And I feel like this is even a missing piece for people that want to, you know, want to talk about manifestation and things like that is like their body isn't able to receive that, which they are trying to call into their life. Um, and when you're in business, especially if you're a small business owner and you are literally doing every single thing yourself, you're going to have to find tools that are going to help you to regulate and stay present in the moment so that you can make those decisions quickly and act upon the things that need to happen, right? And breath work is amazing for that, right? It's a way to help you stay grounded. It's a way to help you stay connected and to clear out the stories and limitations and even the unresolved emotional wounds and trauma that are blocking you from moving forwards, so a lot of time, people that are in leadership, not, you know, this happens for everyone, right? But especially people in business, if you have unaddressed trauma is going to impact your leadership and it's going to impact the way that you show up in your business. It's going to impact the way that you are there with your clients. It's going to impact the way that you you run your business, um, how you're going to be seen and all the things, right? So if you have never addressed your, your um like your father wound, your mother wound, or, or even the mask that you wear, you could be running your business from a completely wounded state of just wanting to be seen and appreciated and to be seeking that external um, like daddy's approval. So you're running in this way that it's 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 coming from, from a, we, uh, a wounded egoic place, right? And it's coming from a place of wanting to be seen rather than wanting to be of service, wanting to, to, to help people. So when you start to get into this work, and it doesn't just have to be breath work. It could be any kind of personal development, but especially when it's body-based stuff, um, the, sy- the systemic changes that can happen from that, right? And um, even over my own journey, man, of, of how I've been wanting to serve and how I've been doing that has changed from different aspects that I've healed and, and worked through. Um, and it's like even in this past year, how I've been wanting to show up has changed from some of the deeper stuff that that I've worked through this year as well, right? It's almost like it's essential for business owners, whether like you're an entrepreneur, you're like you run a co- you own a company or a startup or whatever it is for you. It is essential that you do some form of inner work, and that will propel you forwards, right? So especially like if you never even addressed inner child wounding, right? It, that can really impact how you show up right you might you know especially if you like you're bullied or or hurt in that way you might find it really hard to create a team feeling that people are always trying to take things from you um or you might feel like always like an outsider but when you start to get into the inner child and heal that and you you know what is your inner child wanting you get more into creativity you come back into the innocence of it you know in that joy of living of experiencing it can really shift the narrative of 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 business and how that is for you and I think like a, a, a big piece, I mean, I, I see this happening over the past couple of years, and I think it's going to be huge over um, over the coming years, is learning nervous system regulation as, as an essential tool, um, but becoming an embodied facilitator or an embodied business person, right? Um, and when we look at the word embodied, embodied just means that you are 
uh, all the things that you were consciously thinking of doing are now becoming an unconscious habit, right? However, when you can be embodied in shit that doesn't serve you as well. So is is coming into this more of like this conscious awakening of being embodied in in this way of of serving this greater way, um, being more compassionate, more understanding. Um, being more in integrity. And I see this is going to be a huge thing that is coming for people is that like literally like everything that's been done in the dark will come into the light, especially in this year. There's like literally no more hiding around anything. And so people will either be awoken through their own pain and and suffering deeper, especially like through this year. And even people over these last two years, the amount that's come up for people through the whole COVID, COVID thing, right? You will like either come into it through your own pain and suffering or if you consciously choose to go into it yourself will be the other way right but it's going to be big for people to look into their shadows look into their wounds look into how they're showing up why they're showing up people that are are wanting to be leaders like you know what are you leading who are you leading and what are you leading them towards and what are you leading them from right because most people want to be a leader but they have no idea that it's like self-proclaimed leaders and they put that in the instagram bio and all of a sudden people are like oh this person is a leader because that's what they say they are right i don't think that's going to fly anymore people are going to be able to read through that they're going to be able to see through the bullshit so a big big emphasis on people doing their own inner work and not just like focusing on deep like i've got to go into my pain all the time but how much joy and how much excitement can you bring into your life as well? And I think this is one thing that people uh, can get lost in, especially when they get into the inner work, when they get into this personal development space, is that I got to keep searching for these heavier emotions. I got to keep searching for my anger, my shame, my grief. And it's like, all right, cool. Like you've come into contact with that. Are you now recycling that? Are you, are you getting addicted to those emotions? Like let's, how can you expand and elevate yourself and come into a higher space and you know, even hitting your joy and your excitement. Some people, their nervous systems aren't adapt holding that level of sensation in the body. Cause at one point in time, they've told, they've been told that they can't laugh, that they're having too much fun, that it's not safe to be in joy. So that's the next part, right? Is can we create more resilience and, and more expansion? and more flexibility for people to experience more joy in their life, right? And this is one of the reasons that I love breathwork is because you will experience everything that you have suppressed on all ranges, right? You can experience that grief, that rage, but you can also experience joy, excitement, euphoric bliss, like orgasmic energy, right? You're able to like, some people go into like these full laughing fits from this, this, uh, from all the suppressed joy that they've, they've experienced throughout their life. One of the things you mentioned there, and I, um, I've, he- I've heard a few people predict it this year in terms of all the mess kind of coming to light and not being able to hide behind it, is um, the embodiment. And I think one of the ironies, and I'll get you to kind of speak to it, is that if you haven't done breath work and you don't have a huge window of tolerance in a dysregulated nervous system, it becomes even harder to embody. Can you talk about the importance of opening yourself up from a uh, window of tolerance and nervous system point of view to be able to make embodiment a bit easier. Yes. So when we look at embodiment, right? There's a few pathways to embodiment. And the first one comes from a a conscious idea, right? This conception of like, I'm going to consciously choose to act in this specific way. And then we're getting into integration. So how am I going to integrate this into my life? So I'm consciously going to choose to show up in this way. And then the embodiment comes from just, practice right so you can't rush your embodiment also you can't talk ourselves into embodiment either right so if we're if we're only consciously thinking i need to do this that can be one way however our body needs to be in alignment with our conscious thoughts and our body really is our unconscious so we need to marry the two together and so breath work isn't the only way to regulate the nervous system there's, there's many other ways many other somatic practices that really help to, to expand it with nerve tolerance um and to to get, get ground and create that flexibility through the nervous system but when we are, are, are opening ourselves up to these this new level of embodiment a big part of it is creating safety in the body so the body knows that it's safe to be in these new pathways and to marry it with these elevated levels of emotions and and sensations so you're creating this new reality for the self, right? So our personality is really creating our personal reality, but our personality is is built up of all of the way that we've been programmed and conditioned throughout our whole life. 
And so when we're doing this internal work, we're, we're helping to, to recondition ourselves and to create a new way for us. We have like 60 to 70,000 thoughts, right? And most of those thoughts were yesterday's thoughts and the day before and the day before. So you were constantly thinking the same thoughts. So there was like, you know, um, there was that, was it like that quote, like change your mind, change your life, but it's really, you know, regulate your nervous system and, and change your life. And you, you can't outthink a dysregulated nervous system as well. And so this is where we like really need to marry the two together. We need to have that conscious effort, those that, that change of conscious thoughts, but how much of our nervous system is actually driving those unconscious thoughts for us. And so when we start to repair, we start to discharge that nervous system, it creates that space for us to be able to bring in these new thoughts for ourselves as well, or of thinking in, into possibilities. And so when people are dysregulated or people are outside of that window of tolerance, um, knowing how to regulate and come back into that window of tolerance, right? And sometimes it is through self-regulation when people can't regulate themselves through co-regulation. And one of the issues that people have with, with self-regulating is that they've never learned how to self-regulate themselves. So as a parent, one of your jobs is to create safety through co-regulation. And this is how it is born for, for, for babies and, and for kids, right? Is they are learning how to regulate themselves from their parents. So the parents could never, didn't know how to regulate anger, didn't know how to regulate emotions. They either blew out and was completely emotional all the time, screaming, yelling, shouting, or they completely withdrew, complete avoidance, numbing out. The kid is seeing that and being like, all right, this is how I deal with my emotions. And they are learning those, those same behavioral patterns. So we are able to, to recorrect that through learning how to self-regulate ourselves too. Right. But for some people, it's it's so difficult for them to learn how to self-regulate that they learn that through co-regulation too. And co-regulation is is really important, right? Learning to create safety, grounding this presence through two people together. That there's a lot in that. So um those that are listening, I'd probably play that again. You mentioned before shadow work and having spent a few months obviously listening to you and and working with you, I was really interested in your own journey as well. And obviously breathwork's been a big part of that. What other modalities or rites of passages have you done that have supported you to get you to where you are now? I know you went away for I think 10 days late last year as, as another form of rites of passage or an integration, mm -hmm. but what other modalities or pathways have you used to get you to where you are now? Yeah, a big one for me, especially at the start, was plant medicine, journey with ayahuasca, with um, San Pedro, with Chuma, mushrooms. The, the, I would say the, the most transformative for me was was journey with ayahuasca so journey to the jungle many times done a lot of medicine work out there doing different diets and things like that that's been a huge huge part for me um learning about shadow work and for those you know I'm not sure what shadow work is shadow work is addressing and identifying all the aspects of the self that you have suppressed denied rejected pushed away you know all the skeletons in the closet the parts that you don't want anybody to know about um that you push away the shame um, all that kind of stuff within there. So you're, you're bringing that to light and integrating that into your system, bringing compassion, understanding, acceptance to it. So yeah, plant medicine has been a huge one. Early on, I was, I was working through some tantric stuff, um, different teachers and and mentors as well. Um, a big one for me was, was my own, and I've always been one that would always hold a high standard for myself. And I'd always be, be working towards excellence and and striving striving for that right not for perfection but for excellence and and really being proficient in things and early on i knew that if i wanted to take people into deep places then i would have to be able to do that myself and not just um once or twice but i'd have to guide myself and be comfortable in those spaces so i really embodied the practice of shadow work in a day-to-day -day life right any time that there was triggers or activations or there was these uncomfortable feelings going into it, like what is the reflection of, what is it reminding me of and working through that consistently on, on a daily basis. And there was a couple of years where this was just such a strong practice for me. Um, the ones with plant medicine, it was just showing me all the things, helping that move and heal in the moment. Obviously breath work's been a, a tremendous part as well. But yeah, the biggest one is just really holding myself to that standard and that that level of, of excellence and just holding these levels of, of expectation. And I know some people might have a negative connotation of like, don't hold high expectations for yourself, but I'm someone that I've always, I've always uh, been really drawn to these levels of, of high achieving things. And at the start, I used to have to catch myself of what that would mean if I didn't achieve it or all of that, but I don't hold myself to, 
to that. Like if I'm, if I don't make what I'm expecting, then I get shame or all the rest. I'm like, at least I'm, I'm doing the best that I can, but that's been tremendous for my, for my own, own growth in that. Mate, there's plenty we could talk about. And I know you're a busy man also with a newborn as well. So I appreciate um, the time that you've taken. Um, for people to find out you, your work and your offerings, where's the best spot for them to find you? Yeah, you can go on to Instagram. I'm probably most active on there. So Tim Morrison, then two underscores. Uh, or my website, um, www.tim-morrison.com. Um, but yeah, Instagram is where I release the stuff generally first, unless there's, we have like, you know, if we, if we've got like a, a training or, or a course coming up, I, I will get, you know, an email list for that and they'll get it first, but mo- all of that will be found through my Instagram. And mate, uh, yeah, and I've, I've said it to you before, but I appreciate the work that you, you do. I've, I've looked for male mentors in particular for a long time and, and kind of struggled and have always looked up to you and the work you do and was super grateful to be able to kind of go through your breath work um, certified using that um, and yeah, just continue to love the work that you do and the messages that you put out. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. 